I'm with Arvind Dattar, senior advocate practicing in the Supreme Court for the last several decades. And today we are discussing the verdict by the Karnataka High Court on the hijab. It was a three member bench that delivered this verdict, uh, led by Chief Justice Ritu Rajavasti, Justices Krishna Dikshit and Kazi M. Jebunissa. And the, um, the verdict basically yeah. has said that it has upheld the Udupi Government College, the pre university college in Karnataka upheld its decision for all school students, all female students to wear the hijab, as well as the government's February, February 5th order to wear the hijab. Uh, Mr. Datar, your first comments on this um, judgment by the Karnataka High Court. First of all, good evening and nice to be back again on the channel for, for a long time. Uh, well, I read, read the judgment briefly, not in detail, but I think it's a perfectly well-reasoned judgment. It is correct on all points. It framed basically four issues of constitutional law and the correctness of the government order of 5th February. And I think it's a perfectly correct judgment. I, I think it, the court got it right on all counts. Now, the, the court has said several things, uh, Mr. Datar. The first is, and uh, several interesting observations. You know, the first is that it, it says that those not wearing the hijab do not become sinners under Islam. Then it goes on to say that the Holy Quran does not mandate wearing of the hijab or headgear for Muslim women, and that the wearing of the hijab by Muslim women is not an essential religious practice. Now, we know that some girl students uh, at the Udupi Pre-University College in Karnataka, and this then, this then spread to other colleges in Karnataka, which said that it was part of their, not just their tradition, but their religion to wear the head covering, the hijab, which covered the head and, uh, the, and the shoulders. It did, does not cover the face, we know that, but it covered the shoulders and the head. Now, the Karnataka High, High Court has basically uh, discarded that argument and has gone on to say that it's not a uh, sin under Islam um, uh, and uh, that, that, that not wearing the hijab does not make it mandatory in, in, by the religion. Uh, well, I think it's perfectly correct because, first of all, Hijab means the headscarf. And the court has held that wearing of a head, headscarf is not an essential feature of the Islamic religion. Now, there's a lot of discussion. They have gone into religious texts and gone into the surahs and interpretation of certain Muslim scholars and so on. A, I, well, I'm not a scholar of Islam, but I, of Muslim law, but I do know that no one has told us from the beginning that wearing of a headscarf by girls, school girls, is an essential part of Islamic religious practice. Uh, the court has reasoned it has said so. But I've got a further point that assuming it is part of the Islamic practice. Now, when you go to school, I think it's perfectly right for the school authorities to say that this is our uniform. And at least at the school level, you don't wear the headscarf. Because under Article 25, you have the right to practice, profess and propagate your religion. But the next article says the state can impose reasonable restrictions on any secular activity. And I think going to a public school, going to a government school is perfectly fine where you can wear it. If you want to, if suppose a madrasa or a, a, an Islamic girls school says that all girls should wear the hijab, that's perfectly fine with them. But if you're going to a government school, if you're going to a pre-university pre thing, I don't think that even assuming that you take it to one level and say, yeah, it's, Islam says wear a scarf. But as long as you're going to a government school, and mind you, they can also say that they can, they can say that Hindu uh, students can't start wearing a red saffron dress or wearing a particular headdress. That's not part. If you're in school, you wear a uniform and that is perfectly fine. I think that will be regulating circular, secular activity and will be a reasonable restriction on your right to practice propagate. Nobody is saying wear the hijab, don't wear the hijab at all. Don't wear it in during school hours. And they're not saying don't wear it in college. They're not swearing don't wear it in uh, workplaces or don't wear it in the court if you want to wear the hijab. But don't wear it in school. And I think it's perfectly fine. And very frankly, this was in my uh, humble opinion, I may say so, that this was just an issue which was taken out of context and made as a political uh, game. I mean, I've been to school, you have been to school, I've been studying for the last 50, 60 after independence. Which, where did you have this suddenly think back, oh, wearing hijab is essential part of religion. Where did it come? No, but this it's is from the last 72 years ago. Th that argument, yeah, is, you know, we can discuss that argument because things have evolved these last several decades since you and me went to school. But there is the question of the freedom of the right to choose, isn't it? I mean, today, if I want to send my girls to school wearing the hijab, 
because I believe that it's part of my religious practice, then don't I have under the constitution the right to be able to do as I please according to my dress? I mean, why should certain men or certain judges or certain school teachers decide what, how to clothe me and my girls' children? See, uh, I think with all due respect, I think you got it quite wrong. Because we have to answer the question whether Islam proscribes or Islam mandates that schoolgirls, and where do you draw the line? If it's 10 standard, 8 standard, 6 standard, 5th standard, Montessori, where do you draw the line? Mm -hmm. Is there anything in Islam which says that no girl can step out of the house and even go to a public school or even go to a school unless she wears the hijab? Is there anything like that? I don't know, but I have not seen anything. A at least in the entire arguments raised, there's nothing such, such a thing. Now, you said, suppose your daughters want to go to school and you said it's a freedom of choice. I'm sorry. There is no freedom of choice. There are some reasonable restrictions. I have a right to free speech. I have a right to practice my religion. But tomorrow, I can't. Suppose the school says you can't wear tonsure and wear some Hindu religious masks. They can perfectly prescribe that. Nobody will do this. And mind you, in Article 25, they have specifically made an exception for Sikhs. They said wearing a kirpan is a part of your religious. That's a constitutionally recognized principle. But for Hindus, Christian, Muslim, it is not there. So I don't agree that, you know, you've got daughters and if they want it, there's no freedom of choice. There's of course there's freedom of choice, but it's not absolute. Then you don't go to a government school. You choose some other school you want. You see, because look at it this way. I have granddaughters now. And if they're going to go to school and if they're going to, people are going to wear hijab, people are not going to wear hijab, you're making distinction among children at a very young age. Mm -hmm. We never saw these differences when you were in school. You're unnecessarily exacerbating these differences. And I thought that this was being made wholly politicized. And to answer your question, if indeed it was, there are two things, let's be very clear. One is to say it is an essential part of my religion. And the second thing is to say is part of freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. Now, if it is not a part of your essential uh, religion, then you can't take the choice argument. And as I've said earlier, even if it is an essential part of your religious practice, if it's a government school, and if you are to wear a particular uniform, then you can do, let's, let's take the army. Suppose the government says that you can't wear a hijab as a helicopter pilot. Can you say, you know, it's essential part of my religion. I'll wear a hijab when I'm flying an aircraft or I'm in the military. Of course, Ami has got certain different points, but it could be other uh, things also. I don't think so. I mean, we have to draw the line somewhere. It's not that freedom of choice means you run amok and do whatever you want to do. So these freedoms of choice are not absolute, nor is freedom of speech and expression. Yes. Yes. Okay. You see, uh, the argument in the court was relying on Puttaswami. Right to privacy. Right to privacy includes decisional autonomy, my personal privacy. My Fine, I appreciate that. But if you're going to school and you're wearing your uniform, you can, then you have to stick to the school rules. And I don't see what was wrong with it. And they've not said that don't wear it at all. They say don't wear it in schools. I think it's a very salutary order. So we don't maintain religious differences in school. In fact, I think that by putting this, you're promoting religious division rather than creating a secular kind of a school. Now, the argument by the petitioners was that Article 19, which is a fundamental right, which allows protection of freedom of speech and expression and can be restricted, like you said, only on reasonable grounds and that this is not a reasonable ground. Now, who's to judge which well, I think, is reasonable or, no, or not? Yeah, the who's to judge, the court has to judge. The court has to judge what is reasonable. And if the court full bench has said so, perfectly fine. I have read it, not in great detail, but I went through the judgment in the short time I had. And I don't see any flawed reasoning in what they have done. They have gone into the Bijo Emanuel case and the Jehovah's Witness case. They have distinguished that particular case. They have gone into a South African judgment. They have gone into an English judgment. But I'll say, forget about all these foreign judgments. What does our constitution say? Our constitution says, yes, you can practice your religion. When you can practice your religion, you can practice all the essential facets of your religion. Perfectly fine. But the state can make a law. The state can make a restriction regulating secular activity. Now, going to school, going to a public school, in my opinion, is a secular activity of going to school. Where students of all religions are there, Sikhs, Hindus, Christians, Muslims, everybody is there. So have a uniform uniform. Nobody uh, manifests or portrays his religion in school. Fine. What's wrong with that? Mr. Dada, I, 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 went to a, I went to a boarding school and we were not allowed. We were absolutely, the uniform was very strict. There's no kind of distinction. But Mr. Dada, you know, like you said yourself, in the Indian constitution is different from those of other countries. And I mean, I suppose every constitution is different, right? But the question is that in a country like ours, where religion is so deeply embedded in, in culture, in, our, in societal beliefs, I mean, it's all around us. It's very, very difficult to separate religion from so many other freedoms. 
So in this particular case, what's the harm if these young girls or if their parents want to send them to school with a hijab? It don't you, you know, a lot of parents will now hesitate. They may not send their girls to school at all because of this restriction. I, I don't agree with you at all. I mean, people are going to from 1950, we have, girls have been going to school. Uh, you and I, I mean, I've, got, I've got granddaughters now, maybe you've got daughters going to school. Uh, where did we have any problem of Muslim girls going to school without hijab? Did it impair the education? Did it shock their religious conscience? Did they become sinners for the last 72 years? They were holy people and suddenly they become sinners. I mean, please see the game. Please see how suddenly in January, two girls in Udupi decide to go and it becomes a national protest. I mean, you have to be completely, you should, unless you shut your mind to reality, you should recognize this is a political game which people are playing and we must put an end to it. We should not permit this at all. And I think the Karnataka government did well and the High Court did well in saying in classrooms, don't maintain these religious distinctions. The government can do so. It's a perfectly valid order. It's a reasonable restriction as interpreted by the court. And I don't think anything, and I feel very strongly about this. I don't think anything wrong with the Karnataka High Court saying that, look, in school, in a classroom, between 9 to 5 or 9 to 1, don't wear the hijab. That's all. But what is this political game that you're talking about? I'm asking you a question. If wearing the hijab was so fundamental, was so, what do you call it, inextricable part of Islam, then why weren't girls wearing it to school for 70 years? Can you answer the question? No, perhaps if it was such an essential that, part of it. A... No, but perhaps, you know, oh, in different periods of time, <laughs> there is a greater sense of awareness or, uh, I mean, things change over time, isn't it? It's not like something that didn't happen. I, 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 no, 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 no. I, I, no, I don't. I'm mean, sorry to interrupt, but if it is such an essential part of your religion, it can't suddenly erupt in 2022. It would have been there right from the beginning. Now saying prayers five times a day, doing this, doing that, may be right. For, for me, as a Hindu, I may say my Gayatri Mantra in the morning. That may be part of my this thing. I don't suddenly get up in the morning and say, oh, this is essential part of Hinduism. I will start practicing it today. And two girls get up and everybody in the political spectrum starts supporting and they and you unnecessarily exacerbate it as it is without enough of problems. So what this is the political just, game? I, I, what is the political game that you're referring to? I, I I think that a certain section of the people took it as a political issue and said, oh, we minorities are getting persecuted. They're imposing their views on us. See, if I if there was a saying that girls will not wear hijab at all, like in France, they made it very clear you can't cover your mouth. That was a national issue. You couldn't do it on the streets of Paris. You couldn't do it in a college. You couldn't completely wear a veil. In France, that was a law. That they have not done. So I'm saying that suppose one Karnataka government says that don't wear it in the school and all schools say don't wear it in the school. I don't see what is the harm. And I mean, unless we decide to say that we are not going to accept reality, suddenly all the political parties come and say, yes, 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 this is complete uh, against the majority is persecuting the minority. You're imposing your views on somebody. I don't agree at all. I do mean, you, yeah, do you feel, I think it's a clear political game. It's a clear political game. You think it is a clear political game? 100%. Because if it was an essential practice, this would have been uh, raked up long back. Like, for example, the Shah Rabanu case, I mean, the uh, Shah Rabanu case on the Muslim maintenance. Shah Rabanu. No, uh, Shah, Shah Rabanu. I'm Shah Rabanu came on manifest arbitrage. Shah Rabanu. There was an essential issue. It came up. That, 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 that came up. The talaq issue came up. So these are all issues which came up later. But this simple thing of wearing a hijab at school, and I'm asking you a question. But where do you draw the line? A six standard student, seven standard student. Are you not making them feel that they're not Indian, quote unquote, as a unity in our diversity? You from the school, you say, no, you're separate. You're going to wear this. You look, you look different. You'll be different. I thought so it was you, very, you, very you unhealthy. Know, Mr. Dakar, you also saw, I think we all saw pictures of these young men in saffron scarves. Uh, some said they belong to the Bajrangdal uh, and to other sort of extreme right-wing Hindu organizations who were taunting these girls in the hijab who came on, on bikes, actually, motorcycles to the school. And then they went inside the school. At the time, they were allowed to wear the hijab, but after, after which the school sort of proscribed that. Now, you have these images. On the one hand, the girls in hijab. On the other hand, these young men wearing saffron scarves. I mean, what do you make of what's going on? See, uh, people wearing saffron robes and motorcycles and hitting the girls, absolutely unpardonable. That is absolutely unlawful. And I've already said this. There are extreme right-wing groups who start uh, hitting people on Valentine's Day who start have the notion of Hindu culture and anything against that. I mean, I know sometime back girls wearing jeans were sort of taunted and attacked and so on. These are the 
extreme fringes which should which should be condemned as strongly as the either it's a muslim extremism or hindu extremism nobody supports it these are all the fringes which are not unfortunately india but we are on the short point and i think we should not focus lose our laser focus on a very very simple issue can or cannot a state government prescribe a uniform for schools which prohibits wearing overtly religious symbols and dresses if they can do it i think they can perfectly do it they can tomorrow say you will not wear the uh, what you call the hindu symbols of uh, either as a shaivite or a vaishnavite or don't wear a turban or don't wear this perfectly fine only exception is six where they have, they, they have their long hair is part of the religion it's recognized as such i will say turban yeah now in school i was in a boarding school we had a lot of six who then went on to the army and the air force and so on and so they did very well so they would wear the uh, turban on, uh, on on our parade days and so on it was recognized as essential part of the religion now yes a turban you can say yes but not the hijab because nobody really wore it it suddenly now become all of a sudden and i'll tell you one thing i was in college we had some colleges where girls used to come and debate boys and girls to debate today some of those colleges everybody is wearing the hijab suddenly in the last 10 15 years which is not there before so i don't think it's part of the essence this has become a unnecessary politicized thing you know several politicians have today talked about this have commented about this among uh, among them the chief minister of telangana um uh, mr keshan shekhar reddy he has said something then the former chief minister of jammu and kashmir umar abdullah has also said both these gentlemen have quoted the freedom of choice argument that you can that you have the freedom to choose what you want to wear what kind of dress you want to wear but you are saying that 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 is an invalid invalid argument you see no freedom of choice let's take a, a more simple example suppose i work in an office and there's a dress code in a particular office yeah Suppose there is a dress code in a particular office. You have to wear a tie and a jacket. Let's say it's a dress code. So where is the freedom of choice? Do, don't don't join that uh, office. So what is the freedom of choice? These two chiefs. Uh, I mean, uh, that's the essential part of it. We are entitled to own view. I respect the views of the two chief ministers. They may have their own views. But when you speak constitutionally, when you speak legally, we have to be very precise. There is a right to practice a religion. It is not an absolute right. The government can regulate a secular activity. The government can't regulate a religious activity. Mm-hmm. the government can regulate secular activity and i don't think anybody who knows constitutional law will say public schools government schools are part of the secular framework they are not uh, schools covered by article 29 and 30 where minorities linguistic or religious can run their own educational institutions they are separate we are talking of government public schools they come under article 25 they are not 29 and 30 institutions so they are definitely you can so you said something interesting is the government can regulate secular activity it cannot regulate religious activity now i'm asking you about the uniform civil code and there's a lot of conversation about that right now which is that that such a code must be imposed do you think that this is in some way a precursor of that or do you think that this is linked with that in some way i uh, see uh, the uniform civil code again is fraught with a lot of controversy uh, when the uh, reforms took place for the hindu laws in 1956 maybe it could have been done at that time Uh, as napoleon said politics is the art of the possible i don't think we should get into uniform civil code we have too too many problems facing us particularly economic particularly after the ukraine crisis there things are getting more and more difficult on the economic front jobs and so on and so forth so i think uniform civil code should be put on the back burner it will exacerbate our national problems and will we we'll lose attention from uh, economics growth jobs and go to civil code i personally feel civil code uh, should have been there 50 60 years ago we didn't do it at that point of time now is not the right time okay last couple of and, questions yeah yeah go ahead mr sorry, no go ahead go ahead no so last no, i thought the civil code yeah. yeah please sorry sorry go ahead <laughs> i think i've been go interrupting ahead. you 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 had another thought no no no. no 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 problem this on the on the from civil code yeah okay so last couple of questions on you know on the shahbano case Uh, of the mid 1980s during the rajiv gandhi government and we all know that arif mohammed khan who is right now the governor of kerala came out very strongly against it do you think that today's hijab verdict is is basically a 2022 shahbanu mo- moment or is there a lot of difference between the two no no i i think i think the comparison uh, without meaning disrespect is completely wrong shahbanu case was a huge matter where uh there was no maintenance of muslim women and if you see what the supreme court said was uh, under the criminal procedure code uh, 
uh, maintenance could be prescribed by the court. And then they said that, look, this was against Islam, etc. That case had a checkered history. The judgment came and then there was an amendment to the law and so on and so forth. That was maintenance affecting a large right of women where the criminal procedure court prescribed maintenance, where the court could grant maintenance irrespective of the religion. I mean, the maintenance was the same whether it's a Christian husband or a Hindu husband or a Muslim husband or a Sikh husband. He had to pay maintenance based on certain parameters. Right. Now, suddenly they said, no, that won't apply to Islam. So that is a totally different thing. Today, we are suddenly coming whether school girls should wear hijab or not. So I think we'll be really talking of, uh, to use a cliche, apples and oranges. They're two totally different things. Shabano was a case which affected thousands and thousands of women. The very maintenance, uh, if you read the Shabano facts, she got some hundred and odd rupees of maintenance. That also was said to be wrong, which I thought was not correct. It was a correct judgment, wrongly uh, overruled by the, uh, by the court. That was part that maintenance should have been a secular activity. Shabon was the correct judgment, which was wrongly overruled by the government. Right. So it, to just to come back to this particular verdict, do you feel that some of these girls who went, I mean, on their behalf, the petitions that uh, that came up before the Karnataka High Court, that there is a that there is an enhanced feeling of insecurity uh, that Muslim women or Muslims generally feel? And that this has sort of led them or driven them towards this. And in a sense, the hijab is a manifestation of the security. So you hold on to what you have and you don't want sort of outside influences, however uh, secular they may be or, or however good they may be to be, you know, to sort of inter interfere, your own, inter interfere with your own, um, you know, your tradition or your own sort of space. Uh, again, I don't agree. I don't know seeing the last 72 years of the constitution. I, I have not seen in the last 72 years a kind of a feeling that unless a girl wears a scarf to school, she's going to be insecure. She's going to be this. Suddenly, this came in January 2022 in Udupi. It has not come in any part of India. There are girls going to schools in Tamil Nadu, in Maharashtra, in Bihar, etc. I don't think any school girl in pre-public, pre-university, that is 8, 9, 10, is suddenly feeling secure, insecure by not wearing the hijab. I mean, this is a very uh, extreme argument. And I think it's a completely wrong argument to say that, no, 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 now if you don't allow them to wear hijab, they'll suddenly feel very insecure in school. And what what was happening all these 20 years? I mean, as I told you, it's a complete political game. Would you, would, you say unfortunately, then, would you say then that yeah. it's a bad thing for young girls to wear hijab, that they must be left um, much more free and that the hijab is a constricting argument? Would you make that argument? No, I, well, no, no, I don't say that. Look, if a girl, 10, say if a 15-year-old teenager wants to wear hijab, it's her choice. But the point is, when she goes to the school with a dress code, she can't wear it. If she's wearing a dress code and suppose a public particular institution wears that, look, you can't wear the hijab, you follow the dress code unless you want to challenge it in the court of law. But in school, it can't be challenged. Now, suppose it's a private office. I'm asking, suppose in a private employment, a person wants to uh, wear a hijab and the, suppose the private employment employer says you can't wear it. What will happen? And he says, look, we want to maintain uniformity and all that. We don't want any kind of religious expression. I think the employer will be perfectly justified to doing so. So yeah. last question, so, you know, there are fronts, there, yeah. there are organizations like the Popular Front of India, which are radical Islamist organizations. Hmm. Now, the students hmm. wings of these uh, uh, Islamist organizations have come out in favor of the hijab. So do you think that this is that this sort of, uh, you know, this um, these clashes, if you like, between so-called hmm. secular political parties and Islamist radical parties, do you think that this is becoming a feature? A, a, uh, that it's becoming a feature of our times, of our, of our politics, and that this is not the way to go. See, unfortunately, you saw it. This small issue of hijab, it got so blown out, became a national issue. Everybody said, oh, this is Islam, it's my right, and so on and so forth. This was, as I said, this was taken up. Two girls came to school, they were not allowed. And then all the political parties, they could make capital out of it. And then this was done, and it's very unfortunate. It only diverts our attention from what is most important to us. Yeah. Arvind Datar, thank you so much for your time like, for, uh, on this very controversial uh, episode yeah. and the Karnataka High Court judgment yeah. on this. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.